Hello, I'm Toby Stone. I'm a writer based in Manchester in England and today I'll be reading from my book, Amy and the Bear, which was published by Hicks Dragonis in February of this year. I'm doing this reading for Hannah Kate. Now Hannah Kate is the editor at Hick Dragonis, but also a poet and writer in her own right. I think she's excellent, but obviously she's my editor, so I would say that. So trust instead the words of other poets who are based in this region. For instance, Dominic Berry, who calls her writing both delicate and strong and powerfully communicative. My book, Amy and the Bear, is, as described by Hannah herself, sort of like Pan's Labyrinth set in a Manchester housing estate, which is the best way I've ever found of describing it. Um, if you haven't seen Pan's Labyrinth, you really should, but another way you could look at it is like a dark and shadowed version of The Wizard of Oz. Okay, so I'm going to do a few minutes reading from here. In this book so far, before the reading, there is a character called Amy. Amy's got two different names and that will come up in the segment that I'm going to read from. One of them is the Amy that you see spelt like this. Another one is AMY, the more normal variant of the Amy spelling. She's a little girl in a troubled household. When she cuddles her teddy bear, her, de her teddy bear takes her into another world where the teddy bear becomes a real bear and her guardian. We join Amy at the first time in the book that she travels to the other world. Amy turned her head left towards the fuzzy, cosy corner of her bedroom where her favourite teddy bear lay, Barney, Barnaby Bear. Barney looked at her as though he could barely stand to, askance and rolled to one side. He reached out his patched paw and placed it within Amy's outstretched hand. The teddy bear didn't smile. This was not a time for smiling. Amy was glad her mum didn't spot the teddy bear move his arm and place it against her palm, but then of course her mum couldn't see, not through the linen and through Amy's chest and left shoulder. Besides, her mother was busy. Barney winked at Amy, and the little girl thought as hard as she could about another place, and felt herself falling. The neck-length grass was grey, black where it crowded together. Indistinct, it webbed against her skin. There were insects below her. She could hear their carapaces chittering, their hard limbs chattering, their lips squeaking with pleas. Please don't sit on me, they said, or just please. She ignored their last wishes and sank back until she was sitting down. The sound the grass made was like a sigh, like that of Amy's soul when it upped and left her mum. The grubs crackled. Amy lay back, elbows behind her ears, hands gripping their joints. The stars above her hung in patterns that seemed to make sense, as if the bedroom ceiling was not still artex, the corneas of Amy's eyes, or her mother's face sculpted into her brain. Amy retrieved a hand and reached out, making shapes out of the stars with her forefinger. The stars and her finger distracted the girl from the moon that rose in the north, the witch's moon. It was as yellow as Chris's Stella. Amy had just finished pointing out the outline of a man's nose, the same nose she traced in the wallpaper beside her bed, when a roar battered the long grass. The slim waifs of the stems huddled together. The black of Amy's pupils widened against the dark, pushing it back. Her breath made translucent speech bubbles of vapour that floated away. Her fear was nameless. The roar came again. It sounded almost human and it shouldn't, Amy couldn't help but think. Surely a creature that ate men shouldn't sound like them. Save me, whispered Amy, sitting in a twitch. At the edge of the swirling whirlpool circle of grass that was the glade, there was a circumference of trees with a witch's moon hue to them. Laburnum, thought Amy. The thought registered, but was quickly erased. A bear burst from the trees. Amy stayed very still, and her lungs tried to join in. She closed her lips. You can never tell what kind of mood a man-eating bear might be in. It could be in a girl-eating mood. She shrank where she sat. The bear had an awkward way of moving, hunched on its right. Still, it came fast. The, so the soil shivered at her rump. Then the bear was looming above her. 
its fur ruffled and annoyed, its teeth shredding the pattern of the stars. Come on, girl. The bear looked down at her, canyoning the moon with its snout. It's time to go to school. We can't be here when the moon rises full. In the darker hollows, Amy could not see the wood but could feel the trees. Their fingers were all over her. Of anything, Amy knew the touch of fingers, or rigid, unbending twigs. They ripped at her dress. Amy loved her dress. She stumbled. Climb on my back, girl. He lifted her up, pressing her face into the matted warm fur at his back. It smelt like bark after a quick summer rain. In Amy's extensive experience, there were, corps, there were copses and there were forests. And then there were forests and there were woods. And then there were woods and there were real woods. This was the latter, the latter wood. It was vast and portentous, and it made the hundred acre wood seem as small, as thin, as a drawing on a page. In the latter wood, the potted tendrils of the laburnum trees were black and hollow and wraith-like, pouring at Amy's face. In certain folds of land, the yellow moon poured down through the canopy. By its lunar light, Amy could see faces in the trees. Most of these were ugly. During the day, the trees were dirty and yellow as, her mum would say, a chinky's bum. Amy didn't like yellow because Amy didn't like blondes. In Amy's class at the day school, there was a girl called Lucy. Lucy was golden, and their teacher, Mr. Mann, loved her. Worse, her hair shone as if she were happy. The trees were giving up their ghosts, thinning out as the bear and Amy approached the night school. We're late for registration, said Barnaby, huffing in a you-should-have-got-dressed-quicker sort of way. Amy got down and stared up at Barnaby. In the diseased light, he looked nothing like the teddy bear who slept in her bed. Thank you, Barnaby. I'll tell the teachers it was my fault. I promise you won't get into any trouble. Barnaby smiled wide enough, Amy thought, to accidentally swallow a little girl. I'll go the rest of the way on my own, she said. I'm safe here. The gates aren't far away. Yes. Barnaby cast his eyes at the heavens and they caught a light Amy couldn't see, glinting pure white in the black centre of their beads. In the south, beyond the growing moon and the canopy behind them, the wishing, wanting and needing stars would be twinkling at each other. Have a good night. Amy didn't answer. She was walking away, her delicate, truncated stride, as though she dared not open her legs too wide, part picking its way over snaggled tooth thorns and splattering, secretive brooks. Amy stopped looking up. She could see the night school gates. They were thin, filigree, magical iron and tall. She couldn't see their tops, nor the gargoyles, gargoyles who sat discomforted on their spikes. They had to be high to keep out the witch on her broomstick. Amy stared beyond them to the moon, which seemed caught b between their barbs. It bled moonshine, and the, lo and the lunar curve went on beyond sight, like a breast to a newborn's eye. Cold as a witch's tit, said Amy, her breath floating away in a haze. It was the kind of thing her mother would say, which Amy thought was strange, because her mum's breasts were not cold at all. What Amy did not think strange, what both Amy and Amy thought entirely natural, was that, in this world, her mother was the witch. Glancing skyward, her skin bumping as if it had a thousand moons to rise, Amy ran to the gates, and when they were finally opened, threw them into the night school. Okay, that's the end of my reading from my book, say, Amy and the Bear, published by Hectragonus.